like to welcome you this evening to the inaugural event of the President's Lecture Series. I'm delighted you're here to celebrate the launching of this series with us, and even more pleased um, that our guest, uh, John Hockenbury, agreed to be with us tonight. As you know, in about 30 days, at the end of June, I will be retiring from Lane Community College after 21 years, 16 as president. Thank, thank you. Thank you. There have been so many memorable moments over these years, so many events, so many amazing people. Students, community members, three United States presidents, which isn't bad for a wee lassie from Scotland. Um, but it was this job that allowed me uh, to meet such wonderful people. It has truly been an honor and privilege to serve Lane Community College as president. One of these really special people was the person who made this evening, and indeed the president's lecture series possible, Roberta Connie. Bobby is that person. I remember the first time I met Bobby years ago. She was a quiet, unassuming woman with a big heart. She and her husband, Sam, worked in the lumber industry. After raising her family, she decided to go back to school, and she came to Lane Community College. Though she went on to the University of Oregon, she always claimed Lane as her alma mater. As Sam and Bobby built a successful business, she observed Sam giving back to his alma mater, Oregon State University. I remember our conversation about that. She said, I love it that Sam is giving to you OSU. He is really making a difference for those students. And then she said, with a twinkle in her eye, I have been thinking that I want to do the same, except I want to give to Lane. That conversation led to several gifts, including contributing to the building of our Native American longhouse, the public art that you see around the college, including site-specific sculptures that were created in classes by our students and faculty. All of those were supported by Bobby's generosity. Finally, she decided to make a $1 million gift to the college. She wanted to make a difference by bringing visiting scholars and people renowned in their fields. Thus was born the President's Lecture Series. I'm very grateful to Bobby. Though she passed away, her legacy lives on through this gift. She will continue to provide extraordinary gifts to our students and to our community by supporting bringing new voices to our college and community to bring information, provoke our thinking, and keep us in touch with the world. And I can't think of anything better than a partnership with our own public radio station, KLCC, nor anyone better than our guest tonight to keep us in touch with the world. John Hockenberry got his start in journalism as a news volunteer at KLCC in 1979. He was a student at University of Oregon at the time, and he called KLCC, and there's an apocryphal story here that I, maybe he'll tell you the true story, but it was either a complaint or a compliment. But regardless, our news director, Don Hine, encouraged uh, John Hockenberry to come to the station and see if you can make a difference, and he did. John has over three de decades of broad experience as a journalist and commentator. He's the anchor of the public radio morning show, The Takeaway, which airs on KLCC every weekday. He has reported from all over the world in virtually every medium, having anchored programs for network, cable, and radio. The takeaway was John's return to his roots in public radio, where he was one of the medium's original innovators after 15 years in network and cable television. His reporting at Dateline NBC and ABC News earned him four Emmy Awards, three Peabody Awards, an Edward R. Murrow Award, and a Casey Medal. John has also been recognized for his pioneering online content, hosts the award-winning public radio series, The DNA Files, and currently sits as a distinguished fellow at the prestigious MIT Media Lab. John was one of the first Western broadcast journalists to report from Kurdish refugee camps in northern Iraq and southern Turkey. During the first Gulf War, he reported from Israel, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. He also spent two years as a, as a correspondent based in Jerusalem. 
In an email correspondence to KLCC about his upcoming visit, John expressed his excitement with, Eugene, that's Y-O-U hyphen G-E-N-E, -E, here I come. KLCC is blessed and pleased to welcome John back to his journalistic roots. Please help me give a great Lane County welcome for our first President's Lecture Series scholar, John Hockenbury. What a moment. Uh, what a moment to be back here. So many things to talk about, so many wonderful people in the audience, friends, people who taught me so much, Don Hine, who taught me so much, um, John Stark, who, who he and I shared so many great hours and miserable hours at NPR years ago. Um, and um, uh, this is a president, it's, it's so gratifying, first of all, that the takeaway is on in this market, and that when I hear the voices of this community on our program, I feel such a twinge of, of, of understanding and, and affection for the ways in which people in Eugene understand public radio, which I think is different from most places in the country. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm also extraordinarily gratified to uh, Roberta, our donor, and uh, to Mary, who uh, is retiring, and I, I gather is off to be president of Scotland. That opening is, uh, <laughs> if uh, Brexit keeps going the way it's going, I think uh, you know she probably has a really good opportunity there. Um, but to, to be the inaugural um, speaker at a series like this is so important and meaningful to me because journalism is meaningful, public radio is meaningful. This is a very important moment in a, all of our lives, what's happening in governance, what's happening in politics. And um, the intersection of John Hockenberry, this confused teenager who came to Eugene back in the 70s, and John Hockenberry, this, you know, well, awarded uh, you know, journalist with a great reputation, respected journalist of, of many years who's worked at many networks. Um, you know, th these are part of the same story, and it is an American story, and it's a journalistic story, and it is also a story of why journalism matters and why we care about journalism and why we care about something like our public radio station. And first, what I want to do is we think of public radio as a community, and I want us to act like a community. Um, I think very passionately right now that what is necessary in American civic life is for people not so much to speak, but to do and to act. And that means, that means meeting other people. That means making sure that their day is filled with moments where they turn around and introduce themselves to the person behind them. And I want you to do that right now. Because we think of public radio as a community, but I want us to act like a community. There's not just, there's not just the connection. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's, there you go, there you go. It's not just your connection to me. It's all of our connections. And what I've done there, what I've done there is demonstrate two things. Thing number one is that everybody in Eugene knows each other already, so, you know. <laughs> and thing number two is that I've multiplied the connections. You know, in broadcasting and entertainment, in, um, uh, you know, we, we can have a, a single connection to someone whose voice we love or whose opinion we respect or whose writing we love. But, but to turn that into a community and to multiply each of your connections to me to each of your connections to each other and me, that is powerful. That's what public radio is about. It's marshalling that and making that into something tangible that either informs people, that entertains people, that reminds Americans of their history. Um, and I didn't just spring into the world thinking this, you know. And if you'll excuse me, as you can obviously tell, I mean, I'm not quite dressed. Um, just, just, well, well, no, no, let, 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 I mean, just, just a second, if you don't, if you don't mind. I've got to, I mean, 
I, uh, I arrived a little bit late, um, and, and uh, I just, you know, thought I, I'd just bring a few things. I know that two years ago, Berkus had a lot of props that he brought out, which sort of demonstrated the, um, the changes that have taken place in radio. I'm not going to do that for you tonight, but I am going to offer some props that tell the story of... Um, what I learned in Eugene, as a man, as a boy, as a journalist, and ultimately as an American. This bag last night was lost by Delta Airlines. <laughs> um, they give you this when they deliver the uh, bag. Sorry for the delay, the full red tag. It's kind of adorable. I mean, someone had a meeting to design this, you know. <laughs> I mean, what else could you say? Excuse us for being assholes. You know, I don't, I don't know what, you know. It's a, I, I keep something like that, this, but I'm just going to throw it away. But, uh, you know, anyway, this is the America we live in. Sorry for the delay, you know. Um, I wonder what tag they made for that guy they dragged out of the uh, airline, you know. Um, <clears throat> never do that again, or... Um, that's another story. Um, you know, Eugene has always been a place that teaches things. You know, you learn things in Eugene. And, it, you know, and that, that, you know, it has been true. Um, you know, it was true when I first got here. And I'm, you know, I'm from Midwest and, and the East Coast. I grew up as an uh, IBM brat, moved around. I never stayed in one place long enough. I mean, I was a terrified young person. I, the idea of moving, going to a new place and having to meet new friends and new people, I mean, this, I just had it by the time I was a teenager. And, you know, every, every few years my dad would be transferred to a different uh, IBM facility and I, you know, I'd have to introduce myself in class. I'm, my name's John Hockenberry. You know, and kids, you know, they're so cruel. Hockenberry. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I just thought this was going to be my life, you know, going to places where I'm a stranger and introducing myself and, you know, people would laugh at me, you know, and, 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 and I was also raised a Unitarian, which is not so unusual here in Eugene, but you know, in America, it is actually kind of unusual. And, and I had to discover very late in life that every church doesn't have um, lesbian preacher Sunday, you know. Um, <laughs> I thought that that was something everyone did, uh, but no, no, that's, that's not the case. But, um, but so, I, so I came to Eugene um, as, a, as an East Coaster, a, a, a Midwesterner, and, you know, th things were different here uh, in Eugene. And I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples of, of what I discovered that was different. And, and one of the things I, I kind of discovered last night, I'm staying in that Fifth Street, um, uh, you know, Hotel on Fifth, that, uh, is, is it Brian Obi? Yeah, right. Who used to be mayor, right? He was, a, he was a big, big deal back when I was reporting. I, I might have interviewed him. Um, but if you go to the, the inn on, on Fifth, um, you, you get these in your room, okay? And if you know anything about the Fifth Street Public Market, which you know, everybody knows about, I mean, it's now it's been all very dolled up for kind of Disneyland, I guess. Um, but uh, back when, when I was in Eugene, it was, it was a little more rustic. Um, and I did know that it was a chicken farm, you know, it had some kind of sort of chicken farm here. And so last night as I got in and I was contemplating, you know, there was no bag in my room and, you know, what am I going to wear, you know, um, to this event tonight? Um, I looked at these, at these bottles and I thought to myself, what the hell is this here? I mean, this is, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's got a, this top, and it's got this, you know, curious but very familiar top to it. It's water, delicious water, but this is a milk bottle with a chicken on it. <laughs> Has Brian Obi managed to get milk from a chicken? <laughs> I mean, is that what he's saying? We get our milk from chickens here at the Fifth Street. I mean, I, I don't know. I just thought to myself, that, that's novel. That's very, very novel. I'm taking that home with me. Absolutely. Um, when I first came to Eugene as a young man in a, in a um, wheelchair, I never wore shoes. 
you know, it was the 70s. I mean, I, I grew up in the 60s, you know, as a middle school kid, which is very, very difficult because the adults were having all the fun. You know, they were going to the protests and they were protesting the war and no one cared what a seventh grader had to say about Vietnam. Um, and, and there was no such thing as playlists. So you could, you know, play whatever records you wanted, but no one cared what, what you, you know, what song you liked, you know, and, and the, the fact that you were into the doors d didn't really disturb your parents. They were concerned about other things and paying no attention to you. And when I finally, you know, got to Eugene and I had this spinal cord accident and I was just sort of a couple of years into it, um, you know, my attitude was, yeah, I don't need to wear any damn shoes, you know? I'm in a wheelchair, man. I don't walk, okay? And here I am, you know, in Eugene where everybody runs, right? It's like, it's like running is what everyone has to do. So, so I just decided I'm going to define myself as a guy who, who doesn't wear shoes. You know, that's my protest. That's my, you know, I don't need shoes, so I'm not going to wear them. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be forced to wear shoes by your hypocritical fashion values, okay, man? You know, and I actually, you know, talked that way. I mean, this is how much of a jerk I was back then in 1979. And I remember when I, uh, you know, after a long period of time, I, I had the opportunity to go to NPR. Um, the, 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 the manager of the station was a guy who's still with us, Jim Dunn. He's in his 90s. Extraordinary fellow. Um, he was the only person at KLCC who, who dressed like an adult. Um, everyone else, you know, they had like pitchforks and, you know, they had wagons full of hay and stuff. And they, you know, they were, they were just... You know, they were like, like Eugenians and Springfieldians, you know, but, but, but Jim Dunn was in a, in a suit and tie every single day. And when I was uh, hired to go to, to NPR, and I was sitting there, and you've got the pictures out front, you may have seen, of the white overalls. I was in the white overalls with the ski socks on. Um, uh, Jim Dunn said to me, well, that's great. That's really great. Now you're going to have to buy yourself a pair of shoes, son and you're going to have to buy yourself a shirt. Um, and you're going to have to get yourself a jacket. You know? And I said, oh, no, 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 are you serious? And he goes, yeah. He took me into his office and he says, yes. Please do not go to Washington, DC in those white overalls with those stupid socks and no shoes. You have to, you have to look the part as a reporter. And he reminded me that yeah, there are, I mean, there are senators and, you know, congressmen there, and, and maybe the, you know, the guy in the wheelchair who's like, oh, I'm not wearing your damn shoes, man. It's just not going to have the same credibility on K Street, you know, as he might have at the Fifth Street Public Market. So, indeed, I did get shoes, and um, the shoes that I got were uh, Converse high tops. And, and I remember coming in the week later before I left uh, to go to uh, um, uh, Washington, D.C., and, and I, I had, instead of these, you know, like, really cool Comic-Con um, high tops, uh, I had just red high tops. They were, like, like really fire engine red high tops. And, and I said to Don, I said, is this okay? Uh, or to Jim Don, I said, are these okay? And, and he said, well, you know, they're a start. You'll... <laughs> You'll figure it out someday. Don Hind, however, was like, just, he just chuckled at the idea. He's like, so Jim Dunn got you to wear shoes, man. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> wow, what can I get you to do, you know? And, uh, and so these were my shoes that I went to Washington, D.C. in. Let's see if I can get them on here. And, and... The reason I demonstrate this to you and to sort of openly kind of show what it's like to be in a wheelchair and to, to be, you know, paralyzed and, you know, is to, is to remind myself and you that when I lived here, I was so scared. I mean, I came, this was the first place I came on my own. And, you know, all the times when I was in middle school and, and elementary school where I made that long walk because I was the oldest kid in the family 
to the new school and had to introduce myself, you know, in the classroom. This was my longest walk. I mean, I was in a wheelchair. Nobody knew who I was. I had spent, uh, after rehab in the hospital, my accident was a result of a, a car accident. Um, I'd spent, I'd spent um, you know, six months or so at home. And uh, my mother, God rest her soul, she just passed. Um, you know, her attitude about the whole wheelchair thing was that um, it was the worst moment of her life. Um, <laughs> And, and as a parent now, I can kind of understand that. But it, when and people would come to the door, she would constantly tell the story of the phone call that she got from Pennsylvania that indicated that, that her son had been in an accident and that you know he had a spinal cord injury and he might not walk again. And so my mother, you know, was doting doesn't begin to describe um, her attitude towards her suddenly you know paralyzed son and. When I went off to college at the University of Chicago to go back as a paraplegic, she would drive to Chicago every week and secretly steal my laundry, drive it home to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and do it, and then have it UPSed back to the University of Chicago. Um, a service that my children actually uh, have asked for, uh, <clears throat> which gives you a sense of how things have changed. Um, but that was driving me nuts. And so, you know, staying at home with all of them and uh, like my jacket, pretty good, huh? It's a, a classic Jim Dunn. There we go. I'll keep the Comic-Con. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. So now I'm, you know, now I'm a, now I'm a, a serious journalist, right? With a, with a T-shirt on. Um, but there's a couple of things about me that I want to keep uh, a little bit unusual. Um, Jim, could you give me the uh, special lighting cue that shows off kind of my sexy qualities a little bit? Yep, yep. Bring it all the way down. Bring it all the way. Yep, 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 yep. The one that really enhances just, yeah, okay. So. <laughs> These I did not have when I was a journalist here at uh, KLCC. Um, these light-up wheels. My six-year-old daughters um, suggested when I was looking at a wheelchair catalog um, one day that I should get these, you know, sparkly wheels. And they were basically inline skate wheels that had these lights on them. And, and I remember I was working for Dateline at the time, and at that point I was, you know, very much an experienced journalist and into the kind of um, uh, chauvinism of television, uh, something I learned needed to be dialed back a little bit if you wanted to actually function as an actual communicator. Um, and I remember saying to my daughters, who were six at the time, they're 18 now, um, that um, I can't, you know, I'm a Dateline correspondent, uh, Zoe and Olivia, I, I can't be wearing, you know, I can't be using on my wheelchair sparkly wheels, you know. And, and they, they looked at me, you know, not puzzled, um, but in, in fact, it, it, with this tragic look on their faces, much as they might look at someone, you know, from uh, Czechoslovakia who lived behind the Iron Curtain, you know, in the 1950s, you know, it was, it was sort of, wow, so, so journalists aren't allowed to have sparkly wheels. That must be so sad for you, Father, you know. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of their tone, the whole thing. I, and, I, and I remember I said to myself, yeah, what is, what is that about? You know, and I'm going to have sparkly wheels. And so, you know, I'm free. And ever since I've had sparkly wheels, and it's changed the way people look at me. And that's something I learned here in Eugene. As the scared, young, pre-journalist uh, resident of Springfield, um, I realized, as someone who was living by himself, that I had to learn so much about how to, how to take care of myself physically. Um, you know, there was issues with, you know, plumbing to deal with that, that were not trivial. I mean, if you got something wrong, you get an infection and, it, it, you know, you'd be very, very sick. And without sensation, you know, you could do some really stupid things like I did the first Thanksgiving in Eugene was to set a hot dish, a Corningware dish on my lap 
and fry this leg, you know, for about four minutes. But because I had taken the corningware dish, I write about this in my first book, but I mean, it's I still, it's amazing to me that I actually did this. The corningware dish was in the refrigerator, so the top of the corningware dish was cold. The bottom of it was, you know, 500 degrees, and, you know, I sat it down, and, and the, the scar is still there. My kids ask about the star. What did you do, Dad? You said a and you didn't feel it at all, you know. So these were things I learned in, in Eugene that, you know, you had, to, you had to be careful. You had to really, really be careful. I also learned that you had to be good in the wheelchair. You couldn't suck because if you sucked, it was going to be a spectacle. And uh, getting up curb back in the 70s, there weren't a lot of curb cuts in Eugene. I mean, it was certainly much more progressive than a lot of places, certainly better than Chicago, for heaven's sakes. And... Uh, and I, and I would roll around, and, and I realized that I would try to go up some of these curbs, curbs that were, you know, uh, six, seven inches, and, you know, I'd, I'd flip over. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it. I'd have to make too big of a run, or, or I'd make too big of a run, and I'd flip me forward or something like this, and I had to practice, but there was no place to practice. I mean, I would try to practice during the day uh, uh, going up curbs, and people would gather, and they'd say, is everything okay? Are, are you all right? You know, do you need some? We'll help you up this curb. You know, well-meaning people, of course, but, but there's no place to, to practice living in a wheelchair. You have to do it. So I did it at three at night. I went over to Albertsons in Springfield at about three in the morning, and I would run up these curbs and try to get it right so that I could do it every time absolutely perfectly. And one night, somebody called the cops and said, there's somebody, I think he's in a wheelchair, trying to rob Albertsons. <laughs> Um, don't know exactly what's going on, but you know, the cop came and he looked what I was doing. He, he, he was actually very uh, he, admiring. He said, um, he said, oh, you'll get it, you'll get it, that's good. I mean, I think everyone's a coach in Eugene, you know, <laughs> deep at, down at heart. And so that officer was, was really, really terrific. And, and it, was, it was learning those skills and learning those, those ways of being independent, learning to to not be scared of strangers, learning to, to embrace a new community that taught me more about journalism than anything a journalism school could ever teach. Um, the rest of it was history. The rest of it was, what is this America? And uh, I'll have more to say about what this moment is that we're going through right now, because it is a moment that grasps at every thread of history that uh, uh, goes back to the original colonial times straight up until today, and we are, we are reckoning with the consequences and the circumstances of every aspect of our history right now. And even though we're reasonably prosperous and we have challenges with our economy and we can make all sorts of claims about being a superpower, what is going on deep in the fabric of America right now with this character as uh, president, whatever you may think of him, is a crisis of American identity. And what is, our, what is our government? What is our democracy? Who are we as a people? And what have we done to make it to this point? And what do we have to do from this point on? Um, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But, but in the beginning, it was getting up curbs. That's what you really had to do. And I was going to music school at the time, and I uh, was playing piano, and um, I was not terribly good, and I was a little bit confused about you know, whether music was actually going to be a career choice for me. Um, but I, I loved music, and you know, when you have a spinal cord injury and an accident and all the rules change, you know, you, you don't, you have a different attitude. You just kind of do whatever the hell I want to do, you know what I mean? I, so I'm not going to, you know, be a doctor or this or that. I, I had no particular idea. I just came to Eugene because there was no snow, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and I came to Eugene because, because um, there is, you know, there was, uh, uh, there, there was a certain, um, you know, there was a certain progressive quality to access. Um, and I knew it was going to be more accessible here. And I had thought about going to California because California, of course, has, you know, not even rain, right? You know, it's, and, and, um, and that just, for someone who was kind of raised Protestant Unitarian, that just really felt like it wasn't enough struggle. You know, it, it just... <laughs> That wasn't, you know, you had to have, you, there had to be a little bit of like, uh, you know, uh, headwind, 
and the rain in Eugene was, was enough headwind for me. And I learned in Eugene that, you know, when I came from the Midwest, you know, nobody wore backpacks. Nobody. I mean, nobody wore backpacks. I came to Eugene, everybody wears backpacks. And now everybody wears backpacks. So, I mean, you know, you, you taught me that. Um, I, uh, I wanted to show you that I was so proud. Um, let's see if I can find it in here. I was so, so proud of... Well, I don't have it. I, I, um, I brought a raincoat, you know? <laughs> what a waste. It's like, you know, 90 degrees out. It's perfect. Um, so anyway, I was, I was uh, playing piano, and uh, what I would do in the morning was listen to uh, KLCC, uh, uh, and I was a long-time uh, public radio listener. I, used to, I just loved listening to um, stories about places all around the world. I was into shortwave way back then. I was very into um, public radio when I was in high school, and, and I loved um, just the the thoughtfulness of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a platform of information that would, that would get rid of what I felt was a kind of a bubble of isolation living in the United States. You know, you know, everywhere else, people spoke lots of languages. In the United States, it was just English. And you know, I tried to master German in high school, and I just you know, I couldn't. And you know, instead of blaming myself for not studying, I you know, concluded that there was some sort of toxin in America that prevented us from learning other languages. Um, and so um, I wanted to break out of this bubble and find a way to not be so isolated and feel so isolated. And it was in the middle of, you know, the Cold War and, and uh, you know, everything was so serious and maybe there would be a nuclear strike and we had, um, you know, fallout shelters and all those sorts of things. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, the news of the Cold War and its, its beginning to end was the context of when I arrived in Eugene. And so I would listen, you know, intently to uh, what was going on in the Carter administration. I remember interest rates were like 11.4%. Do, I mean, do you remember? I mean, God, oh my God. And uh, I was living out of Fall Creek, Oregon. And, and um, these are the kinds of news stories that were on the air. And, you know, the Russians invaded Afghanistan. And, um, you know, why did we care? about that exactly, you know, and it was because Russia invaded Afghanistan, they can't invade anywhere, you know, and, but we did Vietnam, it was like, doesn't matter, he's like, Russians invaded Afghanistan, we got to stop that, no Olympics, forget it, you know, and I just, I felt like maybe there's just, we're not getting the complete picture, maybe there's some clarity that, I love listening to shortwave broadcasts, they had a different view, it wasn't a different opinion, it was just a different, wider point of view. So um, I loved listening to KLCC in the morning. I would do my scales, and I would listen to Morning Edition, and then I would do my pieces, and then, uh, and I've told this story to a lot of people, and, and um, so forgive me if it's, if it's a repeat, but I, I remember uh, one week, uh, the Blue Plate special, which was the, the news show at noon, was, was for about three days in a row, just, they, it was something from Morning Edition, that they replayed at noon. And, and it was like the whole show was something from Morning Edition that they replayed at noon. And I'm sitting there, Mr. Pianist, you know, and I'm trying to have a nice relaxed lunch listening to what I've already heard. And I was, you know, and KLCC has this, you know, welcoming, please, we want to hear from you. We want to, we want to know what you think. And, you know, uh, we're a, a public radio station and that really matters to us. And, you know, and so I said, okay, I'm going to show them. Yeah, that's right. So I called up and I get Don Hine on the phone. Um, and I didn't know who Don Hine was. I figured he was like the receptionist at this giant, you know, sort of bureau of public radio something or others. You know, I, I had no idea what the institution was. I'd never seen a public radio station. I didn't have any idea. I, I thought possibly I might get through to Washington, D.C. Who knows? But uh, um, he, he answered the phone and I just, you know, I just locked and loaded and I said, okay, um, well, let me tell you, I listen to KLCC every day, right? And, you know, maybe you should change the name of your show, The Blue Plate Special. <laughs> you know, maybe you should change it to NPR Playback. Huh? I think that would be a little more accurate, don't you think? 
you know. And the reason I tell this story is because Don said right back to me, well, we are a public radio station and we would love to hear what contributions you might make to our news department. And if you'd like to come down here and volunteer, we would be happy to, to uh, you know, accommodate you. And, and, and there's, there's plenty of room and plenty of work for lots of people to do. And so if you think there's something that you'd like to do differently, let's, let's talk about it and please come down to our station. And I mean, I was ready for any answer, any answer, you know. No, it isn't, you know, or, or just, you know, there's nothing wrong with listening to a story twice. I mean, I was, you know, I, I was ready for any answer, but that answer just, it just was like a shovel to the back of the head. I was uh, just like, just sort of like come down there and, and, and be like a reporter. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, well, maybe I'll do that, okay? Click, you know, and and um, and I did, and I did, and and <laughs> and part of what it was about was not Don Hine necessarily, although you know he is to be credited with saying the right thing. Part of it was this collision of me doing scary things in Eugene to survive. I had to do things that made me a little afraid the curb cuts, the whole thing. I mean, I was like, if I was gonna survive, I had to get over this shyness. I had to, you know, I had, I, I had to, to, to go, I, I don't know what the path was, but the path was towards little things that made me nervous, made me afraid, made me, you know, feel like, God, maybe I can't do that or, or something. Um, I was good with microphones because I was, you know, a musician. Uh, I had tape equipment. I knew how to use tape equipment. I didn't know how to edit tape, but I knew how to use uh, quarter-inch tape. Um, I figured, well, maybe, I, you know, I had a voice, um, it was a singing voice. It wasn't a, a, you know, it wasn't a, a speaking voice, but I felt like maybe I could, maybe I could do this. And so I hopped in my little orange pickup truck with the wheelchair on the bike rack that was on the side. Um, my little signature. Um, accessibility device and drove out here to KLCC and where the old station was you'd go underneath this uh, this I don't know what it is is this concrete place where I guess if it was in El Salvador it would be the place where the death squads would leave the bodies or something. I mean it was, it was a scary looking place I mean it was just you know not inviting it didn't say come on in you know welcome to KLCC it was just this like concrete sort of you know prison like um, but it had a, a parking space for a wheelchair, and, and there was this huge concrete ramp that led from the parking lot floor all the way up to the door. And I looked at that, and I went, these are my people. <laughs> I mean, the fact that that ramp was there was so meaningful, and I rolled up the ramp, and it was a hard ramp to roll up, but I did it, you know, no problem. Yeah, good, 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 good. No curb I have to get over, you know, don't know my practicing. It was as though I auditioned for this, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, yeah. And I open the door, and I go in, and, you know, what are they going to think of me, you know? They didn't know that I was, I didn't say, hi, I'm John Hockenberry, the guy in the wheelchair who's complaining about the Blue Plate Special. I was just the guy who was complaining about the Blue Plate Special. They didn't know me from Adam. And I rolled in, and... And I, I introduced myself, and I said that I'd uh, complained a while back, and Don didn't remember at the time. And, uh, and you know, they were busy doing the news, and, and somebody gave me a, a job to do of uh, just, uh, um, you know, collating some copy, typing some news copy off of the wires and stuff like that. And they, Howard Burkus was there getting ready for the newscast, and there was, uh, you know, there was a show that was being produced called Women's Night Out, and wow, and there was a, a show called like Songs of Work, Struggle and Change about workers, you know, and, and, and there was the blues show and it was like there was, there, it was like a deck of cards, you know, just everybody had a show, every, everything, you know, and, and the attitude at, at KLCC was, and you know, we, we've never had one of you. This would be great. We could have the disability show, you know, and, and it's perfect. 
you were meant to come here. You know, there's just something about this welcoming kind of like, of course, this will work. This is what it's all about. We've got the black show and the white, you know, I mean, it was hard to have the black show in, in Eugene, in Lane County, of course, that's hard. But, but, uh, but, they, but they had everybody, everybody was there, every, you know, and, and, and it was sort of this, we want one of you, thanks for coming. You know, and I was, wow. I mean, I was prepared for anything but that. And that sense of welcoming, and that sense of you could just like roll in off the street and you could do reporting. Um, the thing I learned the most of, about, um, <laughs> about reporting was I remember Don gave me this assignment uh, for 4th of July. We need something for the 4th of July. And I said, oh, I want to do a story about fireworks. You know, and I said, okay. He said, okay, great, great, great. And so I went around and, and interviewed people. I mean, there was some, a quality to the volunteer station at, at uh, uh, KLCC that, you know, you could put stuff on the air and you, you would hear it. You know, what you did would get on the air. I mean, there was an editorial process and people would listen to it, but Don, you know, was this curious genius who, who um, you know, there was a way to teach and then there was another way to teach. And, and in Don's way of teaching, I remember I did this 15-minute piece on fireworks, interviewing people about fireworks, and, you know, I went to, like, North Eugene and South Eugene and East Eugene and West Eugene and asked them about fireworks, and they said, fireworks are amazing, you know, and one time I lit it and it blew up and it was crazy, you know, and one time I lit it and it blew up and it was, like, really crazy, you know, and it's like, I love fireworks, we love fireworks, do you like fireworks, little kids? Yeah, we love fireworks, it's really fun, it's a firework. It's on out for 15 minutes, this show. <laughs> But I was editing it together, and as I was editing, you know, each little voice together, I was going, and I'd play it back, and I'd go, oh, this is, this is amazing, this is like, this is like, this is like fireworks, this is like frontline of fireworks, or something, I had a frontline, it didn't even existed back then, but, but I, I was just so pr proud of it, and I remember, I, I finally handed it in to Don, and, and Don was, was mostly like, Thank God we got this Hockenberry jerk who can fill 15 minutes of a show because we don't, you know, everyone's going home for the 4th of July. I mean, we have, we, we don't, we, and there's no news today. And so we, fortunately, we got this 15 minute piece from Hockenberry on fireworks. You know, we'll play it and that'll be the end of that. And uh, I listened to this thing on the way home and I remember, oh my God. That is dreadful. That's torture. That's, that's audience repellent. I mean, that's, that's horrible, that's, you know, I mean, everything I thought was great was bad, and it was repetitious, and it was just, I, but I learned that on the air, man. I, I mean, you know, there's just nothing like, you, you can do that in a screening at 60 Minutes, and I've been at screenings, not at 60 Minutes, but at, at magazine shows where the executive producer is there, or Rick Kaplan at Nightline is there, and you're, you're screening a, a 15 or 20 minute piece for a news show, and the pressure, it could not be more intense you know, about everything that you're doing for this TV program. And, you know, that, that is intense. And they say, no, that's wrong. You know, you got to put the beginning at the end and the end at the beginning, and, you know, and you, and you do it. And then you, you know, you hear it on the air and, you know, it, it all works out. Um, and television is a much more collaborative process. And I think that's why network television, not so much today, but network television really has a kind of uniform voice to it. Authorship in television is harder to see um, with some exceptions. I mean, people like Oprah have authorship of everything that they do. People like Barbara Walters have authorship because they're such distinctive personalities. Um, Peter Jennings had authorship. I think on a good day, I had good authorship of the kind of pieces that I would do, but there it was nothing. Like learning how bad you can suck when a piece is on the air and you know that, uh, I don't know what the audience numbers were back then, but uh, even if it was just 250 people were listening to it, I was like, I can't show my face in public. <laughs> you know. But it was a hugely important lesson. And then I went off to, uh, to NPR, and, and at NPR, I learned that, you know, this idea of volunteers, of volunteering, and, and just walking in off the street and getting on the air was not something that, that other people shared. This was not what NPR was about. It wasn't not about that, um, but it was a different kind of an organization. And I remember uh, my first election that I covered was 1980, when Ronald Reagan took over. 
Um, I was still, it was the very tail end of me being in the Pacific Northwest. I wasn't at KLCC anymore. I was up in uh, Seattle working out of the uplink at the uh, KUOW satellite uplink. And I was covering Packwood and uh, Senator Packwood and his first campaign and he won. And I remember driving to Portland to Packwood headquarters and Jimmy Carter conceded. It was light out. Jimmy Carter conceded. I remember something's wrong. That, that's not quite right. And I remember Ronald Reagan was such a different kind of character coming in. And then I went to Washington to be a part of this change in Washington that took place under Ronald Reagan. And this ethos of democratic values and government for the people and government services for the people was going to be eradicated by the Reagan revolution. And the Reagan revolution accomplished a couple of things. I mean, it turned the economy around but it suspended our belief in Washington, something that every candidate has run on since 1980, Republican and Democrat. Uh, Bill Clinton ran against Washington. And so from 1980 on, we've had this break um, with our sort of sense of respect for government and what government is for. And, and it is a, it is a path that seems so clear to conservatives and seems so clear to Democrats as being wrong, but in fact, it's neither. It is, it is a path that we've all taken and it has led us into a thicket of, of incomprehensibility and what we now are experiencing is a governing crisis, a governance crisis where we vote for a government but we don't like the government we vote for. We, we vote for, we are, we, we are in a democracy, but we have no respect for the values that are represented by the people who work in Washington, whether it's the bureaucracy or whether it's the House and the Senate or whether it's even the Supreme Court. I mean, the Supreme Court has become an institution where there's supposed to be uh, four conservatives and there's supposed to be four liberals and then there's supposed to be one mystery guest, you know, uh, and that's Anthony Kennedy. Um, and that's how it's going to be for a while. And people in Washington who I know who are dear friends of mine, who are serious lawyers who have been solicitor general, um, have said this, the court is, is hurt, the court is damaged. And most Americans don't understand that. It's not about Roe v. Wade, it's not about abortion, it's not about whether the court is conservative or liberal, it's, it's that the court has become a political institution. The court has become a kind of mini legislature. And, and that's so against what the framers wanted. But just back to 1980 for a moment, when I mean, the big thing that happened, of course, in, in 1980 was Mount St. Helens erupted. And um, you know, Howard Berkus was the big reporter at KLCC at the time. And, and uh, we were living out in Fall Creek and uh, we heard something early in the morning uh, we knew that it was possible that the, play, you know, the, the mountain was going to blow. And then, of course, a few hours later the, on television, you saw all the pictures. And Howard went up there and was reporting. And you know, it was kind of extraordinary to see what, the work that he was doing. And, and it was really amazing. And, and I remember feeling as Howard was becoming successful and making a name for himself as a national reporter, I, 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 after having all this fear of being the guy in the wheelchair in the strange place who didn't really know what to do and you know what's my job going to be and I don't have a college degree and I mean you know I suddenly began to think you know I could do this there's a there's a way for me to do this and when Howard left after the mountain um, you know stopped erupting quite so significantly there was still an appetite for the volcano because you know, if you remember back then, I mean, the, the, aside from the economy going haywire in the 70s recession, um, nothing really happened during the Cold War. I mean, we're, we were told that stuff was happening every single day, but if we look back, I mean, nothing really was happening. Um, and when Mount St. Helens erupted, you know, I mean, everything was incremental. Everything was just like tiny little incremental changes of this, that, or the other thing. And when Mount St. Helens erupted, I mean, I remember it said to me, whoa, so like, I mean, stuff can really happen. <laughs> well, because I mean, that, that mountain went from uh, to uh, and, and, and I mean, I'd never seen anything, witnessed anything like that. And, 
And to have been here and to have witnessed it and to feel as though there is incremental change, and that's often what the news is about, but there is revolutionary change. And that's sometimes what the news is about. And knowing the difference between those two, that incremental idea of change, where you believe in the system, and the system's going to get you to step one, and then step one A, and then step one A1, and then that, you know, that, that incremental idea. You know, suddenly, you kind of come to an end, and you realize, this isn't getting us anywhere. And then you have to think, all right, what are the revolutionary changes, the nonlinear, the, the non-incremental changes that are a part of of news that are a part of our lives, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I remember feeling when I went to Washington after Mount St. Helens erupted that um, you know the 21st century was kind of over. It ended a little bit early, you know, and that, that Mount St. Helens was just, just sort of okay. Enough of this quiet stuff, folks, you know. And and it wasn't really quiet stuff because you can't call World War II quiet stuff, you know. Uh, but it was certainly from my lifetime, this period of the 50s and 60s, and of course the turmoil of the 60s was extraordinary. But this this 70s complacency, this sense that we were just sort of marching in step, the riots were over, the the you know the love revolution was over. Um, there was a lot of stuff being made out of plastic. Well, that's good. Um, and and you know, that, that was really all that was going on. And then Mount St. Helens erupted, and boom, you know, it brought us back to, wow, things can change. And that was the first experience in my memory of something that people in World War I had as an experience when August 1914 happened. And suddenly, all of Europe vanished. I mean, all of Europe was hit by a tsunami that, that er eradicated the Ottoman and the Habsburg Empire, uh, empires that had been around for th a thousand years. These are the kinds of changes that were possible. This is what we're living now. And I went off to uh, Washington, D.C., and Lech Wałęsa was confronting, and, and Carol uh, Wojtyła was confronting um, uh, the uh, authorities in, in Poland. Yaroselsky. It was like there was something happening in Eastern Europe, um, but could it really happen? I don't know. Ronald Reagan said, "Bring down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev." And I remember liberals in in uh, Washington and liberals who were my friends said, "Don't say that. He'll drop a bomb," you know, kind of thing. But wow, he's he's speaking the language of non-incremental change. He's speaking this language of revolution, and whether he's conservative or not, that's, that's in another way that things happen. And, and so I spent those early years you know, covering the end of the, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the confrontations with uh, the Polish authorities, the Russian authorities. Um, I went away to the Middle East in, uh, in uh, the mid-'80s and had an extraordinary experience in the Middle East the place where there were so many strangers and I couldn't speak the language, and learning that in the Middle East, um, everything that I knew as a disabled person was true for almost everyone in the Middle East and in the world, that you know, when you wake up every morning, um, well, something's not gonna work out. You know, you, there's gonna be steps, and you know, something's gonna screw up. And uh, you know, when you have a disability, this is your sort of basic attitude. The infrastructure isn't on your side, unlike for most Americans, where it's like, you know, uh, you, you listen to Louis C.K., I mean, some of his routines, you get on an airplane and the Wi-Fi doesn't work, and you go, oh, man, you know, this sucks, you know, kind of thing. And you know, pe pe Americans have such an expectation that things work, and we're such a minority. It's changing. I mean, it's absolutely changing. You know, we've had our 9-11 moments now, um, and we've had our, you know, Donald Trump moment now. And, uh, and, you know, suddenly we're more in tune with the experience of the rest of the world. And I learned that when I went to the Middle East, realizing that, you know, most people in the Middle East didn't expect the infrastructure to work. And the consequence of that was that, you know, if I was in a wheelchair, uh, rolling around in the community and asked, um, you know, needed help going up some stairs, something I would never dare to ask in the United States. I mean, I might, but it would just like, oh, nobody's, I mean, this is just not going to work. Or people's answer would be something like, well, there's a law, isn't there, that's supposed to help you up those stairs, you know? And I said, well, 
you know, I was hoping to have dinner tonight there, you know. And, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and Americans are nice. You know, you just you'd have to kind of lay it out. But in in Jordan or in Cairo or in Iran or or in Somalia, I mean, you'd roll too close to a, a flight of stairs, and people would come, 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 and they would like lift you up the stairs, assuming that you would want to go, and you'd have to say, no, I, no, actually, I don't, I, I don't really want to go up those stairs. But thank you so much. So you'd have to stay, you'd have to stay away from the stairs, because people would just assume that, you know, you needed help, and, uh, and that we were happy to give it. And there was such a liberating sense of, of freedom in that kind of accessibility, the accessibility of the community, the accessibility of people not expecting things to work, um, not expecting things to be perfect. And, and it sort of bonded me with the people in the developing world, and it's really informed my reporting you know, all along. And being in Jerusalem was a, a great experience. It was a sad experience. Reporting on the famine and the deaths in Somalia was a uh, remarkable experience. I'll tell you one story that is intensely meaningful to me, and it really brings me back to Eugene. Um, and it's something I talked about in my uh, TED Talk, which some of you may have seen. I mean, I've done a bunch of TED Talks just because I got connected with that community a long time ago, and it's a, it's a great community, and it's a great story, and, you know, for the longest time, the TED people were just kind of like weird, fringy nerds that had money and um, didn't know what to do with it, and so they would have a conference, and they wanted to entertain themselves, and so they were looking for, like, jugglers and scientists to say interesting things, and... Uh, and then this gradually evolved into Chris Anderson, who took over TED in uh, 2002, um, to this evangelical, you know, he's a British Catholic, so um, Mary, you know what I'm talking about. He's a British Catholic, so he's extraordinarily filled with guilt. And so he, he wants to evangelize and basically turn every TED Talk into, we're going to help things. We're not going to just sit here and do nothing. We're going to help. You know, I ever, so, and so TED Talks have now become this evangelized 20 minutes of advice for everyone, from everyone to everyone else. It's a remarkable and a fantastic thing, but it could only have come from a British Catholic. And that's another story. Um, but in my TED Talk, my last TED Talk that I did in 2011, um, I told the story of being in Congo. Um, and Congo is a place, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Congo is a place that uh, there's no nation there. There is a river there. It used to be Zaire. Um, at the time that I went there, I've been there a couple of times, but the time that I first went there, it was Zaire and uh, Mobutu Sese Seku, whose... Um, Real name was Mobutu Sese Seku, and you know, bringing us back to the um, chicken. Um, his real name was Mobutu Sese Seku, and there were a bunch of other uh, 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 Zairean uh, words that I, I know the translation of, but I can't say. But it, M M Mobutu Sese Seku, the man whose, um, shall we say? manly hardness is so extraordinary that he walks from one hen to the next without any appearance of weariness. Um, that he is the you know, rooster that doesn't ever stop screwing. Um, and and I, mean, I mean, imagine if that was uh, Trump's title or something like that, I mean, I, you know. I mean, he said worse, right? I mean, but, uh, but that, was, that was the president of, of uh, Zaire, and, and, you know, he robbed the country, and he was an extraordinarily corrupt uh, dictator, and the country was falling apart, and I was there in the middle of a, a moment when he had changed the currency. He'd basically taken three denominations of currency out of circulation and had subcontracted to a Swiss printer to print new currency, which basically was a devaluation of the currency, and was and, and people had, you know, uh, about six hours technically to get to the bank to change their money, their wheelbarrows full of money, um, into these new notes. And some banks had were open, and some banks weren't, and, and some banks knew about this, and some didn't. And these were this is all the money these people had, and the entire city of Kinshasa was. 
was just in an absolute uproar. And I was there for ABC News. We were doing a portrait of, uh, we were trying to interview Mobutu and you know, things just got out of hand and we didn't have a chance to have any access to Mobutu, but the rioting that started to take place was a story on the evening news with Peter Jennings. And, and you know, the police and security forces in, uh, in Kinshasa said, stay in the hotel. And we were in this big concrete intercontinental hotel in, in uh, Kinshasa that was full of diamond merchants and just these corrupt characters that, you know, would, it was just not a, I mean, it was just the poor people of, of Congo. I mean, you just, your heart broke for the people of Congo because everyone was there to grab something and to take something. And it was really an echo of the Belgian colonial period where Africa was just raped. And, um, and you could see it all happening, but it was, you know, in the 90s. Um, but it was right out in front of you. And I, I uh, grabbed a, a, a vehicle and a driver who was willing to drive us into the center of, of Kinshasa. And my producer, who was terrified and didn't want to go anywhere, and I said, well, we can't just stay in this stupid hotel looking at these diamond merchants playing you know, poker um, with money of the people of Congo. We've got to see what's going on. And, and I got in this vehicle, I got a cameraman who was like a friend of mine and, you know, who, who was actually willing to go and, you know, using every bit of my, if you're scared of it, maybe you should go do it. You know, I, I, I cashed in every single chip of that little impulse on that day and got in the, the, the Jeep and we went to the center of Kinshasa and it was a sea of rioters. I mean, some people were trying to cr crash the banks and get into the banks. Some people were successful changing money, but then they were being robbed as they went back to their vehicles. Some people, vehicles were being stolen. Some, some people were just tearing open uh, retail uh, um, uh, uh, establishments and looting. And they were looting, they were looting like two by fours. You know, they were looting like pieces of aluminum. They were looting like electrical wires. And they, you know, were just running this stuff back home. And, and it was absolute, total chaos. In the middle of this whole thing was this one cop in a, in a police uniform trying to direct traffic. Um, and, you know, there were people with arms, and there, were, there, were, there was gunfire, and it was, you know, clearly there were militias and people trying to get some sort of advantage, but it was an absolutely lawless situation. And I'm rolling around in the center of that with my, in my chair. My cameraman is getting as much of the wide shot as he can because we realize we do not have a lot of time that we can be messing around there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, out of nowhere comes this young man who's paraplegic like me in a, a, a contraption that he's made himself that's sort of hand-cranked kind of, and he uses it to sell uh, newspapers. It's got this very um, uh, uh, you know, cleverly built compartment for newspapers, and it was full of newspapers. And here he is in the middle of this, you know, everything's falling apart and he's selling newspapers and he comes smiling up to me. He rolls up to me and he looks at my chair and he, and he's just, and he's, he's just completely amazed, but he's not like, he's not like amazed. I've never seen a chair before. He's like, he's like, you know, check out what you know, we, we couldn't speak. There were no language that we had in common, but we would just point to each other's wheelchair pieces. And, and, you know, he had this like great pedal chain drive thing. And I went, that's, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, and I showed him the the, the light up wheels, you know, and, and he was like, oh yeah, 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 you know, and then he and he goes, look at this, you know, and, and he had this like spare tire thing that he had in the back that uh, he could whip out if he got a flat. And I went, oh, I went, that's really great, and we're in the middle of this, of this total chaos. Bullets are streaming, and people are coming nowhere near us. People are, you know, I mean, we're like a leper colony as far as this riot is concerned. <laughs> Nobody wants anything to do with us, but we are like this angelic brotherhood of, of survival. This is, you know, meaningful. This is, this is the language. And I, I was, and I, I looked at his, you know, and I just wanted to get a picture and, you know, can I, is there a way you know, in the middle of all this and the gunfire started, maybe we can, you know, you know, and, and he looked at me, you know, with, and I'll, I'll start, he looked at me with this, not going to happen, you know, and, and he knew that he was going to go off into the crowd and I was going to go back to America and that was going to be, that was going to be that. But we had had this moment that I, I remember 
I'm glad I practiced those curb cuts. Um, I, I did a good job. You know, I wouldn't have wanted to disappoint him. Um, and as he left, he said, Jumbo. And, uh, and that, that something like that, this idea of survival and journalism and curiosity and, and embrace inclusion. I want to know you. Um, I don't think of you as a stranger. If, if, if I think of you as a stranger, there's work I have to do so that you're no longer a stranger. Those values were things I learned here. Those values were things that were, um, were enriched and ignited from inside me because of the experiences that I had here. And if there's any moment as a foreign correspondent that reminds me of, of, of the value of journalism and what can be achieved. And, you know, on the nightly news, everybody had the crazy, the crazy riots, you know. But nobody had the picture of just us two, which was the biggest story of the day. And boy, did I know it. And boy, did he know it. Um, and so um, I want to give you a chance to have some questions um, because there are so many things to think about now in this crisis of governance that I've already referred to. Um, friends of mine from Africa who, uh, you know, during George W. Bush, there was a lot of questioning about, you know, what's going on with, with your president, you know, and, and why would you in, get involved in this war that seems like such a, a, a misguided adventure? And the same with, uh, um, you know, everybody understood 9-11 that there had to be a response, but as, as things went on, and I think you're familiar with this, Hillary Clinton ran on this uh, against Barack Obama, the idea that we needed to improve our, our status in the world, our reputation in the world in some way. Um, but, you know, and then with Obama, the, the question was, um, you know, people would say, you think that having an African-American president or a black president is going to solve things for you, but, you know, you're going to learn it's not quite that way. Um, and I think a lot of people in particularly Africa viewed Obama as very strong in the beginning, but much more of an academic and a detached character who didn't have the qualities of power and leadership that, that they wanted. I mean, we miss that quality of, of I would say, incremental um, uh, and so sobriety uh, in, in, in governance. We miss it now. But we shouldn't trust it so much to the exclusion of recognizing that the election in 2016 was about an understanding collectively that whatever you thought of Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, Donald Trump, we are reaching the end of the sustainability of this system of government. And, this, and, and something has to change, and the change is going to have to come from us. And it's going to have to come from people thinking, what kind of communities do we want to live in? And then how are those communities going to be collectively um, organized in a national government or a state government and then a national government? And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a rethinking of our constitutional values that has to happen now. And that's part of what's going on. And when I ask people in um, the developing world, dear friends of mine in Africa and Asia and places where I've reported you know, what they think of, of Trump. They don't, they don't say, you know, what's going on with you people? What's going on? I mean, in Britain they do because, you know, they're, <laughs> it, how, how could you have done that? Oh, my goodness. How, you know, so tasteless, for heaven's sakes. You know, but nobody else. I mean, the people in the developing world, people outside of Europe, I mean, people in Eastern Europe don't ask this question. They go, yeah, we, we've had one. We've had him. We've had him. You're going to do one of him? You're going to do him? Yeah, we, we, yeah, we know him. We know man with power. I, mean, I have this conversation all the time in New York. You know, these Egyptian cabbies say, Trump, Trump, he's big power with money. We understand big power with money. You know, um, you, you have to figure this out in America, but we know it very well. <laughs> and, 
And so Trump is this character of leadership that's very familiar in the world. And, and you know, we can argue about what's that going to mean? Is it terrifying? Is it, is it a fiasco? Is, will he get impeached? Um, are there policies that he's going to put in place that are awful? And I'm not going to get into that right now because that's not why I'm here. Um, what Trump has done, though, that affects every single one of us, regardless of what we think about our country, is he has uh, closed the chapter on America's 20th century exceptionalism. Um, America can no longer so America can no longer say it's you know either the greatest country in the world or or the light by which all the rest of the world understands governance and democracy and freedom and liberty. No, it's not. We've made extraordinary mistakes. And in fact, the best things, the most important things that are going on in America right now are, you know, post-Ferguson, Americans confronting the history and the consequences of Jim Crow. That the worst terrorism that took place in the United States wasn't 9-11 in New York. It was what happened in Jim Crow in the South for decades. Um, it's being able to say that. It's being able to say that. It's being able to say that, okay, I'll give you Hiroshima, all right, as a, as a response to uh, Jap Japan not surrendering, but, but uh, testing a plutonium bomb on Nagasaki and killing 30,000 civilians, that feels like a war crime to me. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it, we can argue about it. I'm not saying that's true, but, it, but to say it, to suddenly say that's what our history is, and to understand that the consequences of that history produce hatreds and, and tensions between people that we have to unravel. You know, racism isn't just people who are like bummed out about blacks who have to go to Sunday school and learn not to be that way, or African Americans have to stop being mad. No, it's understanding that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow are alive are alive in our society and that we have to actively fight them. And so as a, as a you know, a, a, as an exciting, what, it, what an exciting moment this is in America right now, it's Americans finally getting out of that isolation, confronting that history. And the most important thing about public radio is it's the place, it's the institution that is uniquely capable of asking the question, you know, or, or of, ma of making the statement, which is really much more important than asking the question, it's you're invited to the conversation. Public radio stations need all of them around the country to be able to say, we want everyone to be in this conversation. We want to make sure that we're inviting everyone to that conversation because public radio is the representative of freedom and democracy and information and the fact that everyone is permitted in our divided society to speak. We hear it on the takeaway all the time. It's a great thing. It's a great thing that you air the takeaway here. It's a beautiful thing that I can't even begin to repay that you've invited me here for this moment. Um, and I just want to say thank you, KLCC. Thank you, Eugene, for helping a confused young man 40 years ago um, figure out what it was he was supposed to do. And I didn't do it half bad, and uh, that you recognize that is uh, intensely, intensely meaningful for me. So thank you so much. Yeah. So you got questions? Raise your hands. We got microphones all over the place here. Ask me about anything. We got this one right there, right, right here. Okay, great. Hi. And I'm a journalism professor at the University of Oregon, and I'm very pleased that, that we have you here and that we'll spend some time with you later this week. I'm wondering what you think. Um, I know that when you developed the, the takeaway, part of it was having journalism be more uh, conversational and accessible, and you've, you've developed this style in which you present it. Um, how, do we, how, do we get, how do we get that message across to some of our, our, our other legacy media companies in terms of of getting away from that stodgy, you, you mimicked it, that sort of standing in front of the state house for this millennial generation that just doesn't relate to that at all? Um, I mean, it's a critically important question. And it, 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 I think the, the antidote to it is what's going on in the digital world right now. 
um, the digital participatory media that is very, very frightening in the ways in which it creates, you know, uh, stories that are false or perpetuates myths that are, uh, in some cases, racist and full of hatred. It, it also, you know, is filled with different styles of discourse. When we started the takeaway, you know, uh, the, the, the questions were always, you know, who do we want to, you know, what do we want to cover? Who do we want to have on the air? Um, who, you know, we asked very traditional questions about um, what, what is this program and what's needed? And what we came to was that, you know, those weren't the questions to ask. It's not the, the news content that's important, although that is important on any given day. It's not the talent that's important, although you want to have talent that can, that can function and that can, can work in, in a world where rapidly changing events are, are, you know, require someone to be, you know, kind of on their game. Um, it's about the discourse that, you know, people talk about the discourse is so degraded in the United States right now, but everyone's screaming at everyone else. You know, the solution to that is not to stop screaming. The solution to that is to think hard about what is the discourse of media. And, and we, the metaphor that we came up with was something very, very simple. And we talked about it at an editorial meeting. And it was, it came from a couple of mothers, new mothers, who, who said, you know, you know what I think this show should be like? And they would describe that, you know, as they were, you know, stay-at-home moms or if they were home on maternity leave, they would be uh, rolling through, you know, going through Central Park with their strollers. And, and, you know, they would be by themselves, of course, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about, you know, their, their baby and what's going on and, you know, issues with motherhood and all this sort of thing. And they'd roll by a bunch of other mothers who were together at a, at a uh, playground and they'd hear a conversation and they'd, they'd, they'd go, Oh, oh, you know, and they'd roll up to that conversation. They go, you know, I have something to say about that, and they'd listen for a while, and then they, they, and the way these women told the story of this, this is how the show should be. It should be, your Americans are walking through this landscape, and they overhear a program called The Takeaway that's saying something really interesting that draws them in, and they listen for a while, and then they're given an opportunity to say something. And, and, and they say, in, and, and, in, and in every aspect of that discourse, it's conversational. It, you, you, don't list, you don't walk up, to, if, if there's a bunch of people standing in a park and they're going, and they're giving speeches to each other, I think, you, know, you go away, you move away from them, you don't go anywhere near them. But if there are people who are having a, uh, an animated, intelligent conversation and, and you know, someone's talking about some aspect of history that interests you and, and you know, they say something that, Wow, I never thought of it that way. And you know, that's something I've thought of, and there's a way for you to get into that conversation. That's the discourse and dynamic that we want to reproduce every single day. Um, where I see it happening is in digital media. I think that people you know, do rants in blogs, and it attracts the attention of people who come in, and it will create a conversation that sometimes becomes a podcast. And I think the development of podcasts is very much like the takeaways development, where it's 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 a it's conversational, topical, and meant for you to, you know, you you, you download it, so it's kind of appointment media. But but you're 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 being with people who are friendly and who are telling you something that that is friendly. And I think this podcast discourse is going to overwhelm. I mean, I think as time goes on. You know, the people on the, on the Today Show and, and Good Morning America, I mean, sound more and more ridiculous. And, you know, Fox News, they sound, it's not, and it's not because of the opinions. I mean, I'm even, I'm even worried about Rachel Maddow, who I think sounds like she's just sort of preaching and, and, and doing this. And I, and I think it's, it's just, it's not, I, I mean, I want, Rachel, I want to know what you, what you, what you think. I don't want to know what you prepared as your assignment today in, in, in you know, grad school. Question right here. First of all, thank you for uh, coming out and spending some time with us. Uh, this is the first chance I've had to, to listen to you, and you're amazing. I'm, I'm oh, basically thank you very much. I'm basically a newbie to the area, even though I've been here uh, since '97 from uh, LA. But um, I was a kid on tour. I blew off my college scholarship to go on the road, and um, I got lucky enough to be with uh, Smokey Robinson for a year. Great. He was VP of Motown Records. So we were flying into literally every city in the world. 
and this was in the 70s, and we were met with adulation and hero worship, and oh my God, the great band, we'd fly in, sound check, um, uh, do the show, fly out, and never got a chance to experience that culture, that moment, that second where we possibly could have been enriched with the different feelings and thoughts throughout the world about not only the way they live their lives, but what they think of us as a people. And we're getting further away from that. I, here I am, 60 years old, and I'm afraid to try to write to someone in Russia because I might be under investigation. Uh, just by reaching out, wanting to reach out to another country and say, you know what, we have an administration that's kind of nuts right now, and um, that really doesn't represent the average Joe. And since you've been there, and you've been literally rolling on the streets of everywhere and, and, and getting that sense of what these folks are about and what they think about us, how can we as average people reach out and say, this is who we are? We, well, I think the, the, the 21st century is about this, this huge global convergence of people's cross-national. Um, you know, you've got Google Translate right now. So suddenly people can have conversations who could never have conversations in the past. You've got um, the proliferation of uh, the Asian languages. And, um, you know, you've got the, uh, uh, the ways in which people using the Internet can bypass national boundaries and create um, uh, communities that are organized around things that are completely different from from the traditional nation state. And that's what's happening now. And I think people are not afraid to do that. And I think people are, you know, it's not gonna all be the internet. And there, we have all kinds of problems associated with, first of all, the way the internet works and the way that the internet doesn't serve lots of people in the world. And, and th that needs to be addressed. But this is the century of communication surmounting the obstacles and the walls created by national boundaries and the, you know, the obsolete walls that are being suggested by our politicians in, in Washington, D.C. Um, the walls are coming down. Go to, go to China, go, on the, go, go to the Great Wall of China and you'll see something that's magnificent and beautiful and it's covered with moss and is completely ineffectual. And, you know, it's just like, like that was the stupidest idea in the history of the world. I mean, that, that was just about the dumbest thing anybody ever did. And, and, and still, you're amazed by it. But walls aren't the thing, you know. Um, I was, uh, we have time for some more questions? One more question, one more question, and then I have a, 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 a one more little thing to do for you before I go. Right here, you had your hand up first. Uh, Dale Phil Donahue here. Phil Donahue, there's a name from the past, boy. Thank you so much. Your voice is just delightful. I was closing my eyes just listening to you here. And You're very sweet. <laughs> um, my concern is about um, the funding of NPR. And this year, since January, I've never written so many emails to the White House, to NPR um, National, saying, who are these people that are funding, like the Koch brothers? How come Steve Inskeep sounds so um, right? wing at this point. Can you discuss that a little well, bit? And then I want you to know, I think Rachel is fantastic. I think she's a fighter, no, and I'm I happy mean, to no. hear her voice. People love, people love Rachel, and, and she's, you know, she's not going anywhere. And, and I think, um, you know, I think if, I mean, I, it's not clear that MSNBC will survive in the form that it is. But I mean, you know, Rachel has a, has a uh, you know, has a following, and, and she, she has a discourse. And I think, you know, I worry about it when it feels really sort of stiff sometimes. But the one thing I would say about public broadcasting, in the Gingrich period during the Reagan Revolution in the 80s, um, you know, part of the contract with America was to get rid of public broadcasting, was to zero out the Corporation for Public Broadcasting yeah. and to get rid of, of public broadcasting because it was obviously a subsidy that um, went against private sector media that has to pay its own way. And um, two things were clear, private sector media wasn't doing news, and there was a need for news. And, and so, you know, 
first of all, people wanted the news product that public radio was delivering. So the argument that we need to zero this out out of some sort of market-based fairness doctrine, it was just was absurd. But the thing that they discovered, the Republicans in trying to zero out the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, was what Lockheed Martin discovered, you know, when they had um, problems with, with uh, you know, something like uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, C-17 transport, which is a Boeing product, I believe, um, and they competed to, to win that. And uh, Boeing had one advantage that uh, Lockheed Martin didn't have, and that was that Boeing had more factories and more um, facilities that manufactured Boeing products in more congressional districts than Lockheed Martin did. And so when it came to push and shove, um, and, and one official from Lockheed Martin remarked uh, on the Corporation for Public Broadcasting debate one time um, at a correspondence dinner that I was at, it said, you know, what Gingrich didn't figure out till it was too late is that NPR is like the greatest defense contractor that's ever been ever been created. It's got it's got a factory in every congressional district in the United States. <laughs> and it's got voters who give them money for free and love them. And so there's no way you're going to you're going to undo that. Now, that said, there are things and changes that are going to take place in, in media, and I do think that um, it's contingent upon public radio to embrace and enlarge its invitation to all people, um, a, 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 all people of all backgrounds, um, to make sure that people feel a separation from the public idea of radio and the opinion idea of what often public radio programming is. And I think that's a real challenge. That's going to be a real challenge. I mean, I think, you know, I don't want to talk about the Koch brothers and, you know, right now, because we're sort of at the end of the, the program right now. But, you know, it is the case that the Koch brothers and uh, George Soros are actually united right now in uh, dealing with issues like climate change and anti-cancer programs. And, you know, there are a lot of issues and, and gerrymandering um, there are a lot of issues that have become so unsustainable in, uh, in America right now that the fundraising to get something done is more important than just simply to fund the party that represents the opinion that I agree with. And so um, we're going to see more and more of that. We're going to see scary things. We're going to see things we don't agree with. We're going to see things that, that make us very nervous about the future of America. But um, I did a, uh, an event the other night um, that I think is very meaningful to this point. And in the, in the mid-1800s, America was going through a period of time where it was trying to find its identity. Um, you know, and that included everything from getting rid of slavery, the Civil War, um, but artists and writers were also trying to find an American voice, an American... Um, uh, uh, ethos that, that represented the values of the framers, but, but was not European, was not British. And Walt Whitman was, was someone who really, who really worked hard at that. And we did a, a live reading of A Song of Myself, which I suppose sounds like you know, something that Donald Trump might have next to his bedside stand um, <laughs> today. But A Song of Myself is, is, is a gorgeous poem about the reverence for all of the various kinds of people who are working and trying and doing in America. And it recognizes all of the mistakes that are being made at the same time and the mistakes of the Civil War and the mistakes of slavery and, and all of these various things. And it's incorporated into that one poem. And that poem is this gospel of American values as a kind of religion of tolerance a religion of embrace, a religion of, of uh, uh, welcome. Um, and it's not about immigration in simple terms. It's, it's about something that was fundamentally new at the time and was very different from the Robert Burns poems that were also very popular in the 1800s, um, but, but weren't meaningful to Americans in the way that these words were. 
the gospel of tolerance in America exists. It's Whitman, it's these other poets, it's Thoreau, it's, it's um, Emerson. Um, and you know, there's stuff about all of them that they get wrong. And whenever you hear people taking the gospel of American tolerance and turning it into this exceptionalist, we are the greatest country in the world, so everybody listen up because we got it right. Um, there's an antidote, and it's my last little prop here. And it's um, the other thing I learned in Eugene. It's that um, unlike Chicago, unlike um, New York, unlike uh, the places that I grew up, the IBM factory towns that were the places where I lived in the suburbs, in Eugene, you could pull out an instrument and start singing, and everyone would sing along. <laughs> Let's just do one. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. This land was made for you and me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Hockenberry.